Okay, I'm not sure what happened to Guido, um, but welcome. Um, I've talked to all of you personally. Um, one of the most important things that we can do in terms of an inner exercise is to learn how to relax. Um, Mr. Gurdjieff says that this is the beginning of certain forms of inner exercises. The ability to allow our body to enter into a relaxed state. So perhaps as you're sitting there listening to me, you can become aware of where in your body you may feel a little bit of tension. Uh, perhaps in your forehead or maybe in your shoulders or lower back or uh, uh, I think someone else may be joining us or I'm not sure. I've, I've, my phone. Well, that mm -hmm. was your phone. Okay. Yeah. I, this is the first time I've done it with more than two people. Uh, two people. So I, I have no idea what it's going to look like when I go back and look at the recording and whatever. Um, but just become aware of your body. Try and do an internal scan of your body and try to pay attention to where you notice any kind of tension. Um, tension generally tends to be habitual in nature. Um, I used to carry a lot of tension in my jaw. Some people it's the shoulders, you know, uh, the neck, um, sometimes the arms, the hands. Uh, try to do that internal scan Notice where you carry this tension. And then also realize that as we work through this exercise, the fact that we are located in such disparate locations around the world, we're all thinking the same thoughts. We're all bringing our awareness to the same parts of the body. So we're going to be developing in a very subtle way a degree of rapport with each other. So Mr. Gurdjieff says that for the most part, most relaxation should start the top of the head and then move down to the feet. So just bring your awareness to the top of your head and just allow the top of your head to relax and then relax your forehead, relax your eyebrows, Relax your eyes, relax your nose and face, your ears and the finer muscles in the sides of your head. Relax your mouth and jaw, relax your throat, relax your neck, the back of your neck, relax your shoulders, and then focus on relaxing your upper arms, your biceps, your elbows, relaxing your lower arms, your wrists, relaxing the, the top of your hands, the palms of your hands, relaxing the fingers, the muscles, the bones in your hands. And then bring your attention to your chest and relax your chest. And then down to your midriff and solar plexus and just relax those. And then down to your lower abdomen, relaxing your lower abdomen. And then bring your awareness back up to your shoulder blades and upper back, relaxing them, relaxing your middle back, your lower back, bringing your awareness to your hips and buttocks, relaxing them. Then relaxing your upper legs, your thighs and hamstrings, your knees, your lower legs, your shins and calves. And finally, relaxing your feet, the top and bottom of your feet, your toes and heels, the bones and muscles in your feet. Now let's do this again. Bring your awareness to the top of your head and just allow the relaxation to slowly descend down into your forehead, your eyebrows, your eyes, your nose and face, the finer muscles in the sides of your head, down into your mouth and jaw, your throat and neck, your shoulders, 
uh, this time your upper arms, your upper torso, so your chest, upper arms, upper back, down to your midriff, middle arms, middle back, your uh, lower torso, your, your abdomen, lower arms, lower back, down to your hips, your hands, down to your buttocks, uh, down to your upper legs, your knees, your lower legs, relaxing them, down to the bottom of your feet. And perhaps you can even feel a soft flow of energy out through the bottom of your feet. And let's do this one third time, a, a bit quicker. So just relaxing from your head down to your neck, down to your shoulders, down your torso to your hips, down your legs to your feet. And then quickly scan your body, become aware of where you may still be holding tension, and just allow that part to relax. And then become aware of your breath. Become aware of your breathing and begin to take some nice conscious breaths. Breathing in through your nose and being aware of the air as it flows up through, past your, the bridge of your nose, down into your lungs and back out. J.T. Bennett says that the way we get the higher hydrogens, the way we absorb the higher particles in the air that are there that most people do not absorb, that we need to grow our being is through conscious breathing. So become conscious of your breath, conscious of your breathing. And then start by looking right up to the bridge of your eyes where you see the dark part. Look right up and then moving around in a clockwise fashion, move to the right, looking to the extreme right, looking down to the bottom and then looking over to the left. And then with your eyes looking up again, then looking to the right, then looking down at the bottom and then looking over to the left and doing it a third time, looking up to the right, down to the bottom, and then to the left, and then finishing at the top. And then stare straight ahead of you. And while staring straight ahead, become aware of your upper peripheral vision. So just the roof at the top of your vision. Then become aware of your side peripheral vision, your bottom peripheral vision, and then the left side peripheral vision. And we'll do this twice more. So staring straight ahead, Become aware of the top, the side peripheral vision, the bottom, the left, the top, the sides, the bottom, and the left. And the interesting thing about self-remembering and mindful awareness is also becoming more aware of the things that are happening in the peripheral parts of our awareness. So the peripheral part of our vision, the peripheral parts of our sound, the periphery of our smell, the periphery of our taste, so that the taste in our mouth, to start becoming aware of the edges of our perception. And now as a vessel fills with warm golden honey, let's imagine our bodies filling with sensation. So let's imagine filling with sensation from the bottom of our feet. So from our toes to our heels, then filling with sensation from our bottom of our feet to our ankles, and then filling with sensation from the bottom of our feet up to our knees, up to our hips, up to our lower torso, up to our middle torso, up to our shoulders, and then filling with sensation to our hands, our lower arms, our upper arms, up to our shoulders, filling with sensation from the bottom of our feet all the way up to our shoulders, up to our neck, up to the top of our head. Now, the two things that I did, the 
relaxing from the head down and the sensation from the bottom of our feet up to the top of our head are probably two of the earliest uh, inner exercises that are taught in the work. Now, I forgot at the beginning of doing it that, you know, it's always good to focus in our mind why we are doing this. And I like to focus along three lines. I'm doing this for myself. I am doing this for my fellow human being. And I'm doing this for the planet herself. Every time we step up into the mindful state, every time we transform a higher level of energy, we are actually ever so slightly growing our being, but we are also helping the planet. Now, the way to finish an inner exercise as well, it's very important. Mr. Gurdjieff says that we emanate. And we want to keep some of these emanations for ourselves. And so the way to end an inner exercise is in your mind, just say, may the results of this exercise. So just repeat that in your mind. May the results or may results from this exercise, may results from this exercise be transformed within me for my being. Um, we can also say, may they be transubstantiated within me. Um, the basis of this work is really going inwards. It's really learning to be mindful of more and more perceptions. And I've mentioned to this to, you know, to most of you, I didn't mention it to you, Michael, we talked about something else. Um, I'll just uh, pull this up. Just give me one second. Um, uh, so, growing our being. The left is waking sleep where we normally live. The middle is self-remembering, personal consciousness, and the right is the ultimate goal, the development of the real I. Um, they're all represented in the other diagrams as well. Um, when we transform hydrogen 48, we're in a very mechanical state. It's waking sleep, or we're a little more than automatons and machines. And so by becoming mindful, by focusing on my, the mindful awareness of our body, by becoming aware of our body from the bottom of our feet to the top of our head, we are actually stepping up into the next level. I'm over on the left-hand side, um, the, the level with 48 is slumbering man, and we're stepping up into the mindful state. Now, becoming aware of our body is uh, in the middle diagram at the top. It's the left-hand octave. This is the octave of food. And so we're really beginning with the physical body. We're beginning with becoming aware of our physical body. And I'm just going to turn this off. I don't want to do a lot of talking today, but I just want to sort of, you know, make it so that we understand that we're really, literally, really are growing our being at a higher level. Every time we become mindful, every time we become aware of our physical body as one organic whole, and that's what we want to build towards, this complete awareness of our physical body and the, the sensation of our body, if we have to build it up comes from the bottom and we build it upwards. But as I've mentioned to some of you, uh, you know, in our conversations, we want to develop the sensation of self, this awareness of our entire body as one organic whole. Uh, it is the basic prerequisite for all of the inner exercises that follow. And this is why it's such an important one. Um, but I don't want to really go into too great a detail in that right now, because I'd like us to go around and uh, sort of introduce ourselves. And I can begin with myself. Um, obviously, um, you, you, you know, all of you, we've, we've uh, video conferenced. Um, I've been a student of these teachings since 1981. I was introduced to them by a professor of psychology at uh, one of the universities in Toronto. I was 23. And in that moment, 
well, he taught the class to self-remember. I was the only one who got it. Um, I couldn't understand for years why I was the only one affected, but uh, I understand now why I was. Um, I had a magnetic center, and there were things in me waiting for that kind of experience. So he made me step into the self-remembering state, a fairly advanced form of self-remembering. And in that moment, my life changed. And everything that I was planning on, I was sort of a normal person with normal goals. It all changed in a moment. And I knew my life would never be the same. And so I've been pursuing these teachings at uh, different levels, deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper for the last 37 years. Um, they are central to the work I do as a hypnotherapist. They're central to how I live my life. And... You know, I try to self-remember. I try to be as conscious as I can, as often as I can. And I do actually a pretty good job compared to even uh, 10 years ago. I, I wasn't able to do what I am able to do now. Um, only in the last six or seven years have I been able to talk and self-sense and maintain that awareness of my body. But I took a lot of wrong roads. I, I didn't understand um, the way I was supposed to do things. Uh, I've been in groups. I've spent most of my life out of groups. And now that uh, I, I'm at a certain level, I can look back and see what I did right and what I did wrong. And I know that I can help all of you accelerate your evolution because you won't make the same mistakes I did. Um, if I could go back and speak to my younger self and just say a single word, as long as I could have a hyphenated word, it would be self-sensing. If I could go back and talk to my 23-year-old self, spend more time in the body, bring yourself into the body over and over and over again, because this is where it all begins. It begins with the body and with the breath. Um, so um, why don't we go around? We'll do it at the top of the screen. Martin, um, can you introduce yourself? and just say a little bit about, you know, what you're doing way up there in Norway, um, you know, by the fjords and, uh, yeah, we can't hear you. Are you talking? Yeah. Can, can you all hear me? Yeah, now I can. Okay. Um, yeah, so, um, I'm Martin, that's my name, um, I'm 20, 23 years old, and, uh, yeah, I'm born and raised in Norway, and, uh, I study at the university, yeah, uh, a subject called we call it Philip Sleep in uh, Norwegian, which would roughly translate into um, outdoor living, uh, outdoor education. But it's uh, it's a word consisting of uh, three syllables. And the first is "fi," uh, which is free. The other is "lut," uh, which is air, and the, the third is "lid," which is life. It's it's uh, life in the free air. It's kind of a corny um, translation, but um, yeah. So 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 it's um, a lot of outdoor. Um, our classroom is, is outdoors. It's uh, at the glaciers and um, in the mountains, learning how to to, to read the snow and. Uh, to, travel safety and things like that. Um, yeah, and uh, you can still hear me, okay? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, um, prior to that, I was, um, yeah, well, I was attending normal gymnasium and went into the Navy for a year, and mandatory service. Is, is conscription in the Navy mandatory? <laughs> Uh, conscription um, as a concept, is, uh, yeah, it's either you get conscripted into the Navy, the Army, or the Air Force, but um, you have to do a year's service. 
with yeah a year of service. Um, yeah, but uh, in 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 uh, what do you say? Technically, it's still construction, yeah. but uh, nowadays it's only it's it's just, it's a kind of selection. Uh, a lot of people want to go, uh, but doesn't have the opportunity uh, because they this they select the personnel. So in 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 uh, practical in terms of practicality, it's not every if you don't want to go, you don't have to go. Yeah. But yeah, that's just a uh, detail. But, uh, and then uh, and then I worked some, uh, and then I and then I came here. So, I mean, a couple of things I want to point out for everyone is um, being in the military. Uh, I've never been in the military, but you you develop a sense of discipline. Um, it takes you outside of yourself, and it allows you to grow up much quicker. And the other thing is um, you spent a year. As a shepherd? Yeah, it was not a full year, but uh, yeah, it was uh, quite an interesting period of time. Um, yeah, that was one of the jobs I did after the military. Um, but in the middle of nowhere, by yourself a lot, a lot of quiet, yeah. um, not talking, not connected to other people. Um, what, 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 were, what kind of animals? I never asked what the animals you were looking after were. It was uh, cheap. Cheap. So you'd be up in the mountains or the hills and uh, yes. protect them from wolves and yeah. things, or uh, just keeping an eye on them. Yeah, so it was uh, high up in the mountains, and uh, yeah, it's just keeping an eye on them, registering where you see them, and if the number of of lambs they have is corresponding to the to the markings and. Uh, yeah, just keeping an eye. There's these uh, signs of predators like wolverines. Um, yeah. Um, okay. Uh, okay. Um, I'm going to move to uh, Reggie. Reggie, have you been able to hear us? I yeah. just want to verify because I've got these controls, and there was a rooster crowing and everything, so I could mute your microphone, which I did. <laughs> Mm -hmm. uh, because there was noise in the background. If you yeah. want to speak, you know, raise your hand and I'll see it. But okay. I don't think it's too noisy with the, 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 the I don't know if it's a, a rooster or whatever. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, I can mute your, I can mute everyone's se microphone separately or all together. But I muted yours because Martin's microphone was a little soft. But uh, yeah. can you tell us a bit about yourself, uh, uh, Reggie? It, sure. Uh, first, uh, hello everybody. I'm glad uh, to be here. My name is Reggie Reginald. I live in a, a very small town in Mexico near Guadalajara. I work as a teacher. Um, yeah, I have a lot of animals right here, so I'm going to try to find a place where, you know, it would be quiet. Uh, I've been interested on in this kind of uh, subject for a long, long time. I know I, I am, you know, happy now because I'm going to practice with uh, people. It's hard to find people to practice right here in Mexico because first I, I live in a very small town. Uh, I know, I'm married. I have uh, two daughters. I'm, I'm happy to be here and, you know, to practice, to, to, to do things rather than j just read. And to share with people doing the same thing is an amazing uh, thing I, I believe to be aware, to be mindful, uh, to grow as a person. So I don't know what else to say. Yeah. I mean, you're, you're, you're like, uh, in a sense, like uh, um, Martin, in the fact that you're nice and isolated. Um, you're not near any major, I mean, you're in a small town, right? But Very not, small town. Not yeah. a major city. So, um, and then being in Mexico, I guess the windows open and lots of animals around. And uh, yeah. um, is it what kind of uh, uh, geography is around you? Is it dry? Is it deserty? Or I mean, we've got all these m images of Mexico from movies. Um, yeah, lush. Is, is it because Mexico can be? You know, you've got rainforests there and some quite uh, green space, mm -hmm. uh, and then you've got some pretty dry areas as well. Um, 
Yeah, right here is a very, how can you say, it, uh, middle weather template. It's, I think, the, the word. Uh, just uh, yesterday, uh, we started a uh, rain season. So it's, 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 it's a beautiful town where, where I, li I live. It's, uh, I mean, it is not too high, not too low, as you know, weather. So it's green. Let me show you. Maybe. I don't know if, no, it's hard to see because it's just sun. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of bright. Um, yeah, <laughs> yeah, bright. Sorry. But yeah, I would say that it's template. I don't know if the word is the correct word. But it's you know in the middle, not too yeah. cold. Mild. Uh, mild. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> hey, so uh, you're interested in esoteric ideas. Um, can you give us a little background? Um, you're 42, right? I am. Uh, yeah. Exactly. Mm, yeah. Always. I mean, I told you that I like uh, Buddhism a lot. Uh, I mean the the ideas of meditation, you know, to be here, to be aware. Uh, I read, I've been reading a lot of all the subject subjects that I read. It's about that, but like I said, it's difficult because nobody practices right here. There's no help. Okay, um, Michael. Okay, um, well. My it's 11, 11 o'clock at night down there, so... Um. Yeah, <laughs> it is. Um, so yeah, the name's Mark. I'm 45. Um, I'm originally from New Zealand, which is sort of next door to Australia, a lot smaller. Um, I moved to Australia about six years ago with who is now my ex-wife. Um, we came to Australia because she had family here. Um, as it currently is a job, I'm doing career driving. Um, but I've also had a, an, I came across this work in 2012, sort of mid 2012, um, and I happened to read and search the miraculous and that just really blew my mind and just grabbed me big time. Um, I've had a lot of other spiritual esoteric type works before that, um, but none stood out like and so it's the right to study out for me. It really, really, really got me big time hooked, I guess you might say. So I have three children, um, 21, 17, and 10. Big age gap between them. Um, yeah, that's about it, I guess. Just, yeah. Well, I mean, I, I, we've been Facebook friends for four years now. Yeah. Um, and uh, you have a martial arts background as well? I did. Um, I haven't done that for about a year. But yes, I was um, used to do a lot of training in uh, jiu-jitsu mostly, kickboxing and jiu-jitsu, bit of MMA as well. Um, but sort of that's one of the things I sort of stopped as I got more and more into this work, certain things had to drop away, I guess. Um, that was one of the things that was dropped away of its own accord. It wasn't that I necessarily said to myself, I have to give this up or give that up. Certain things just didn't hold the same value anymore, I guess. Uh, well, how far did you get within martial arts? Um, I was doing it for a number of years, so, you know, I didn't always go to grades and worry about belts never meant anything to me, to be honest. Um, I would, sometimes I just wouldn't even go to grading, even though I was supposed to be awarded a grading. I just did it for fun. Um, why, why did you stop a year ago? Like I said, I just, I just didn't have any value for me anymore. I just... Um, there was no real reason. It just f fell away of its own accord. I, I found that uh, people who do have a martial arts background are more able to sense themselves, more able to be in their body, more aware of their physical component, and it gives them an advantage 
at the initial stages of the work. Um, did you find that at all? Um, well, I, I guess I can't contrast myself for not knowing martial arts, but um, yeah, I sense in my body, I mean, it, it's, it's an effort, but I can certainly have a sense of myself as an organic whole. Okay, um, Ben. All right, hello everyone, I'm 22. Uh, I live in Virginia. I am a music and education major. Um, right now, I guess in my life, I'm learning a bunch of languages, learning new ideas. Um, and I specifically came into um, the Gur Gurginian, maybe, Gurginian ideas from the Enneagram community. Um, and I was kind of seeking like the origins of it. And I ended up reading um, what is the psychology of man's possible evolution, a little bit of search in search of the miraculous, uh, meanings with remarkable men. And the first one was um, I am, therefore, I forgot. Okay. But uh, yeah. You know, um, like, uh, life is real only then when I am. Life is, right, right, right. That's a pretty advanced book to read. Um, that was the first one that I read, actually. That one, okay. <laughs> that, that's the one that, you know, we, you, you should read a lot of other books uh, before you even get to that one because it's uh, fairly difficult to understand. Yeah. Um, so you, you, you've uh, only been acquainted with these teachings for, uh, was it four months? Yeah, pretty like um, four months, yeah. Okay. I mean, and then, you know, I was really interested, but then the problem, was, it's like, how do you actually practice them? How do you use them? And how do you start everything? Because it doesn't necessarily say that. Yeah. And I feel like, you know, sometimes like in, in some of the communities, if you ask around, it's kind of more theoretical things yeah. and more, you know, ungrounded and just, I don't know. It, uh, quite often it is the blind leading the blind. Um, yes. I mean, there was a big problem in the fact that when Mr. Gurdjieff died, perhaps 20, maybe 30 people in the world were trained enough to begin to lead groups. And then In Search of the Miraculous got published in 1950, and suddenly 10,000 or even more wanted to learn about these teachings. And uh, so they, they actually developed a hierarchical structure that's more like the Catholic Church. And mm -hmm. um, it was all, it's what they had to do. But it's, it put a damper on um a lot of groups a lot of groups are they're still i know that the gurdjieff foundation in toronto they're still introducing the teachings the exact same way they have done for the last 60 70 years um mm -hmm. there's been very little change and most of the people in the groups now are 60 70 years old and they're not really bringing in new people they're not trying to explore with this kind of technology see if we can do it um, mm -hmm. this way. So this is an experiment. So uh, thank you for joining my experiment. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. You know, hopefully as we, we meet and we begin to work through these ideas and we begin to develop will tasks uh, and begin to practice things, um, mm -hmm. we will get a better understanding of it. And I also want to say, you know, if you have any questions or whatever, you know, send me a message or whatever. I'm, I'm, more than happy to uh, answer the questions. As I've said to all of you, everything that I do is recorded. Um, and, you know, I hope to have weekly meetings uh, with each of you to find out a little bit more about you, find out where you're broken, find out where you need fixing, where you're leaking energy, um, different things to, so that we can all step up and uh, change. And I also want this, as I've said, um, I didn't really talk about it with uh, uh, you, Michael, but it was in some of my videos that I want this to be sort of a core that I put up online and so other people can begin to think about some of these ideas. They can begin to reflect on these. So this is the, the group that we're, we're doing online is what I consider to be the esoteric, the inner group. And then there's going to be the mesoteric group uh, on Facebook and people can watch our videos. They can see the issues that we're working through. They can contact me to uh, try and make a ripple-like effect, see the, you know, allow this to spread um in a deeper way um let's go back to you martin um what do you hope what what is your aim what do you hope to get out of this
Do we have any more? Yes, yeah. Um, it's, it's somewhat hard to put, put my finger on it, but I thought about it yesterday after we sent the message. Um, and as, as you and I talked about, um, um, it's just been this um, natural, well, not natural, but it's been this sequence of, of um, not events, but realizations that um, It's, it's uh, led me to the to the observation and, and realization that so much, almost all of it, maybe, of, of my life and um, the way you know I can I conduct myself. And, um, it's it's. It's mechanical. Um, um, just looking back, how I've lived my life, I can see how everything's been so rooted in unconsciousness and um, mechanical influences influenced by the external environment and. Um, and so, so it's it's this, uh, yeah. And and down the path, it led me to to Georgia, um, and it resonated with with me very much. Um, these ideas, and um, so to to. Put it all in, in one sentence um, to become um, just use it as a as, as a capitalist maybe I'm just using that word uh, to to expedite like you said um, the inner processes that are happening now um, and. Uh, become fully conscious from it. Um, and I realize by, by, by saying things like one day, it's, uh, it's so problem problematic to say it, but uh, I'm just using those, those words to think to, to okay. it. Uh, something that's still very abstract. But, yeah. Okay. Good. Um, what about you, uh, Reggie? Um, what, My aim? Yeah, what would you hope to achieve? Uh, okay, uh, there is a core idea uh, in this system that we are uh, in a sleeping you know, state. Uh, I discover myself from time to time that I, have that I am you know, living in the future, living in the past, worrying, and I spend not so much time right here in the present. Um, it's it, it's that I, I want to, to be awake. I I want to be mindful. It's the main idea. I understand the main idea of, of the system. Uh, I would like to do that. To okay. yeah, to abandon that state. Okay, uh, Michael. For me, is to develop an inner freedom, regardless of what's happening externally, to find a place within myself that's unaffected, that watches the, the pendulum swing back and forth, but isn't, that knows it's not the pendulum, the thing that it's free, inwardly free, have an inner freedom. And to know my triggers, to know in advance when something comes up, 
here's my pattern, here's my, and to see that and not be that. To be able to stand in front of these things. Okay. Um, ben, you're, what are you hoping to achieve? You're in. Um, I was really interested in all of the ideas and I'm really looking for like practical things to work on always. And I guess a, a steady light or a, a certain way of living or certain principles of living that I can use all my life. Um, and I'm definitely interested in like the idea of, you know, knowing like the core essence of like people and um, in myself for that matter. And just, I don't know, just more understand awareness and yes. And oh, to figure out and to figure out like, you know, the problems that exist within me, I guess, in that sense. Okay. Um, for myself, uh, Beelzebub Tales to His Grandson. Uh, it's an incredible book. It took me, I don't know how many years to make, make it through my first reading. And my first reading, I was really upset at the book. I had all these m notes in the margins and going, this is stupid and this is ridiculous. And how could he say this? The second time I read it, I felt so chastened. It's like, oh my God, everywhere I had gotten upset, there was a deeper meaning. Something else was hidden with in what I got upset about. And it was like he was consciously and purposefully pressing my buttons. Um, I've read it numerous times now. I think I've read it six times. I've listened to it six times. Um, it's an incredible book. Every time I read it, it's like there's a new book that I uncover in it. There's something else in it. And I, I, I've read it, you know, cover to cover six times. But there are parts of it, like the chapters in Ashiata Shaimesh, that I've read hundreds of times. Um, I've done word searches for um, being impulses and gone through and looked at every single occasion of numerous words in that book. So it's, you know, not just reading it from start to finish. I've delved into aspects of it, doing searches. You know, the, the, the fortunate thing about uh, having it as a PDF file is you can type in a word and you can see every instance of that word, go and read it. So I've looked at it, I've combed through it. Um, the last time I read it, it was a profound manual on what has gone wrong with this planet. Uh, our species, humanity has fallen out of balance. And Mr. Gurdjieff, uh, you know, he didn't use these words, but we're not going to solve the problem of humanity on this planet through recycling. Recycling helps through all of the legislation and the environmental awareness. All of that helps. But the problem is, is humanity is like a pyramid. And the, the higher states... You know, it's like the, the, the people are no longer there. Let me uh, bring my diagram back up if I can find it. Um, whoops, give me a second. Um, so most people are the left. They're the level of waking sleep. They're transforming a very mechanical, habitual level of energy. The next is personally conscious. Just to become mindful of our hands is a step into the level of personal consciousness. But the more personally conscious we become, the more with our head brain, our body brain, and our feeling brain, working along all three lines, the more we begin to represent this inner, the, the central um, transformation of energies. This is the state of full self-remembering. So this is being mindful in the body brain or the head brain, the body brain and the feeling brain. The next level up is the development of the real eye, the awakened state. Um, Mr. Gurdjieff says that 
if we look at the, you know, the ancient diagram of every living thing, which I've sort of put into a chart here, you know, we start with the metals, the minerals, the plants, the invertebrates, the vertebrates, uh, natural man, which should be mindful man, the angels, the archangels, the eternal unchanging, the absolute. There is this tapestry of energies that go up and energies that go down. So we eat an apple and we transform some of those energies up and we also transform some of those energies down. So some, you know, it's like a, a metaphor that I came up with is you walk along and you see a beach of golden sand and you take a pan out of your backpack and you begin to pan for gold. What you do is you separate the gold from the sand. So you end up with a pile of gold and a pile of sand. Um, so when we eat the apple, we're transforming what's within the apple, we're pulling out the more refined things and we're refining them upwards. And also the coarse things are being refined downwards. So every act of eating, every act of breathing, all of our impressions, we're doing this constantly. We are raising things up and we are um, coarsening things. Every time you raise something up, you coarsen it. And uh, this is the basis when Mr. Gurdjieff said that, you know, every action causes the opposite action. So, you know, if something causes light, it causes dark. Uh, in other words, so if you refine gold, you also refine or pull sand out of the golden sand. Now, he said that the higher the energy we transform, the higher we are of service to this planet. And he said that most people, the large percentage of humanity, are doing exactly what great nature requires of them. They're transforming a very habitual, very automatic level of energy. Um, J.G. Bennett actually said that Mr. Gurdjieff told him that when we make species go extinct, parts of humanity are drafted in to transform that level of energy. So, you know, the, the example a lot of people have used have been the great bison that were in the Great Plains in North America. Um, in order to starve the Indian tribes, you know, 100 years ago, they killed them all off. And what that meant was that a whole section of humanity had to become more, excuse me, herd-like to fulfill that energy requirement, to plug it in. Um, but it's like there's this massive tapestry of energies flowing up and energies flowing down. And Mr. Gurdjieff said the problem with the planet is that humanity has become out of balance. And great nature, to a certain extent, can adapt us at a mechanical level. And uh, in uh, Beelzebub Tales, he said that great nature has done this by shortening the duration of our experience and by changing a few things inside of us. But when we look at these different energies, you know, moving from, you know, the metals all the way up to the absolute, the real problem becomes apparent when we realize that there are millions and millions of species on this planet, but they go up to the vertebrates. And then for the next three levels, a single species is required to transform the energies across those different levels. And uh, um, basically there are three different levels to men, almost like three separate species. And it's the upper levels, the upper end of humanity that in the last um, few hundred years have gotten very distorted. And uh, Mr. Gurdjieff traces this problem back to the rise of mass media, uh, and which really feeds the head brain. And the internet is the latest example of it. It's all up in the mind, it's all up in beliefs, it's up in judgments and things like that. And we don't really live in our body, we don't really live in our feelings. And he said that we don't need a massive change in humanity to bring the planet back into alignment. Uh, he said quality rather than quantity. Um, so we've got to figure out how to get a, a significant section, but not an immense amount of people, self-remembering. Um, he said that was the most important 
thing that we can teach people. And not only does he, it, is Beelzebub Tales, you know, is there a book on, you know, the ecological catastrophe that's coming and the, the, the degeneration of humanity that's playing a role in it. There's also a book on how to go about influencing people. Um, he talks about, I forget the character's name, who got them to stop doing animal sacrifice. He went into religious traditions and tried to change them from the inside and introduce new things that made them stop that. Um, a lot of Beelzebub Tales actually is devoted to Buddhism and to be able to argue Buddhism with Buddhists and to teach them how to be more mindful in terms of self-remembering. So my aim, I'm very concerned with the planet, I'm very concerned with the environment, my aim is to try to bring this awareness to the forefront that humanity has degenerated, that the way to stop this degeneration is to teach not a huge segment of the population, but to begin to teach people mindful awareness, this mindful growth of our being, this, this growing our being. And it is literally a growing of our being. And um, some of you are far, fairly new to the work. Uh, some of you have been a little bit longer and understand some things. Um, if we look at the middle diagram, the left is the octave of food. Um, it starts with the mouth, and then it goes to the stomach, and then it goes to the duodenum, and then to the liver, uh, then to the uh, cerebral hemispheres in the head, then to the cerebellum, and finally into the testes. Um, this is all mapped out entails the actual process of the transformation of these energies upwards. But then the next octave is the octave of air, which is the octave of our emotions. Um, this is the hardest one for a lot of people to work on, but air comes in, we breathe it in, it moves up to the level of 48, and it needs an outside shock, and it doesn't get that. Because the next level, actually, go, I'll go to the left one, um, the octave of impressions, it comes in, it doesn't really need to be transformed up to feed our food. And so we have to consciously begin to work on our energies. And um, we do this by fixing the leaks at our lower level, finding out where we're broken, finding out um, all of those parts of our being that need to be refined, that, uh, uh, you know, if we're too angry or if we're too despairing or if we're too fearful or whatever, find out where we are kind of broken and begin to fix it and begin to release the energies at the lower level. And the other way to do it is to begin to work on being more mindful, pulling ourselves up continually over and over again. Um, let me pull up another diagram that I've shown some of you. Uh, to find this. Uh, so, you know, they talk about man number one, two, and three, man number four, man number five. Um, this is similar to the old diagram, the one that I just showed you. Um, for a normal human being, they're the first, you know, the nine squares, um, hydrogen 96, 48, 24. 96, when Mr. Gurdjieff talks about feeding the moon, it's at that level of our being that we feed the moon. These are the really dark, negative, destructive, explosive emotions like road rage or homicidal rage or upset where we really lose ourselves. Um, then the level of 48 is where we're little more than machines, we're automatons. We're ruled by habitual awareness um, where things more or less just happen to us. Now, we are a three-story energy factory, so we're capable of living in the mindful state, which is hydrogen 24. Um, and there are three dimensions to this. You know, we have the intellectual, the physical, and the emotional. Um, so most people live in this square. Um, and we're capable of turning the lights on in the, 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 the upper floor by being mindful, we can be mindful of what we see if someone asks us to, or what we hear, or what we smell, or what we taste. We're able to be mindful of the sensations of our body. We're even able to, if we can, and for some people this is hard, to be mindful of what we're feeling right now. And I say hard for some people, because for a lot of people the emotional center is atrophied. 
and they're not really in tune with their feelings. But our goal is really to shift our being up so that our lower level is where we are habitual and mechanical. Our central level is where we are mindful. And then at the upper level, we tap into conscious energy, the conscious awareness. Now, the ultimate goal is to move up into the state of the real eye, which is the top one. But that's not so important for the health of the planet. It's the middle one. It's bringing people up into that middle level of self-remembering in a full and roundabout way that Mr. Gurdjieff said we must really focus on right now in this moment. So for me, uh, I'm just going to let go of this again. So for me, my aim is to figure out how to do this, to figure out how to begin to help people step up to a different level to transform a higher energy of uh, a higher level of energy so as to be of a greater service to this planet. Um, I'll show you one final thing. Um, this, when I read the tales and realized it, um, this became my idea fix A. It is still my idea fix A. It's still my aim. It's still where I'm coming from. And, um, you know, I serve great nature, I serve the earth, I serve our common mother. I, these phrases, great nature, our common mother, the earth, all come from tales. Um, we are here on this planet. Um, this planet is at some kind of point where it can really get messed up. And the thing that will mess it up is humanity. Um, but we can also transcend it and we can step up and we can do what we're supposed to do. Now, Mr. Gurdjieff also said that this extends well beyond the planet because Earth herself is part of the ray of creation. And if Earth messes up, it's going to mess up the planetary realm, it's going to mess up the sun, it's going to reverberate throughout the universe. Um, so this is more than our planet and entails. Um, it, you may think it's kind of metaphorical. Uh, he also implies that there are much higher beings who have come and are around the earth right now trying to help the earth, that there have been councils. I mean, the way he's presented in tales is councils of archangels, councils of other beings. Um, he says that the problem is the, an organ was implanted in us. Um, in the base of our spine called the Kunda buffer. And uh, even though it was removed, um, we're still suffering from the effects of it. Um, that organ, as far as I can understand, is the ego. And, um, you know, if I go back to the, uh, one of the diagrams, I, I mean, I'm speaking at a very high level right now. And uh, I will explain a lot of these things throughout. Um, this, let me see if I can bring us in a bit more. This here, C12, is the biggest problem facing us. Um, C12 is the sexual energy. Um, it's why there is such an emphasis on self-sensing. Um, C12 is supposed to come into contact with so 48 to produce La 24 in terms of the alchemic alchemy of human transformation what this means is that every time we sense our body every time we engage in any kind of act of self-sensing whether or not it's our hands or our whole body or aware of our breathing a little bit of c12 is coming into contact with so 48 and the awareness of our body the sensation of self that physical awareness of my body from the bottom of my feet to the top of my head is this alchemical reaction between C12 sexual energy and so 48 the mechanical awareness of my body so you know if we can pretend or if we can be not mindful of our body right now for instance a moment ago our knees were transforming so 48 
now that we're aware of our knees, we've stepped up one level to law 24 and law 24 is fueling that awareness of our knees. But C12 gets stolen by the octave of air and by the octave of impressions. And underneath C12 is the cause of a lot of our emotional breaks, a lot of our problems. And so it's learning how to distinguish and use these energies properly. And also within C12 is the ego. And I believe the manifestation of the misuse of C12 is in various egocentric activities. Um, so, for instance, Uspensky says that negative emotions are useless. Uspensky didn't fully understand these teachings. 99% of negative emotions are useless. There are certain negative emotions which are absolutely useful. And Mr. Gurdjieff corrects these. He, he realizes that Uspensky was, excuse me, telling people things that were slightly off. And it's, there's a certain vehemence, for instance, emotionally, to the use of uh, or misuse of C12. But there's a certain level of subjectivity. There's a certain level of me, me, me. Um, if you have a negative emotion, if you're angry, Angry can be an absolutely justified and correct objective emotion if there is some real injustice and the anger is fueling an attempt to stop that injustice. But quite often our anger is, they shouldn't have said that to me and how can they treat me like that and how can they do this to me, 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 underneath it. You will be able to taste the ego. Um... All negative emotions like depression, despair, um, there are objective forms of them, but mostly they're very subjective. They're very me, me, me. And the difference between objective and subjective is the ego and not the ego. So it's the biggest problem that prevents us from stepping up into the mindful state is the misuse of that specific energy and the fact that it fuels the ego and it's all this clawing and grasping and me 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 how could they do that to me or i want to climb the mountain to be famous or i want that gold medal or i want um you know so much of our activities on this planet are fueled by the misuse of that energy and that energy in its pure state should be lawfully used to sense our entire body as one organic whole if you can sense your body as one organic whole from the bottom of your feet to the top of your head, uh, Mr. Gurdjieff called this the sensation of self, the full and complete physical awareness of our body in this moment, you are actually transforming that energy in a lawful way. So my goal is to help people to make this clear, to explain this, uh, to give exercises, to pull ourselves up at the higher level, so to become mindful at the higher level, and then also to begin to explore where we are misusing this energy emotionally, where we are misusing it um, intellectually. I'm just recently, uh, I'm, I'm in a phase where I'm posting some quotes from In Search of the Miraculous that talk about the beginning levels of self-observation um, getting out of habit, starting to observe ourselves, starting to observe where we are mechanically, starting to observe our imagination. The imagination and daydreaming is one of the places where we waste this energy the most. If you look at your daydreams, if you look at your imagination and you say, where is my ego involved in this? And you really pursue it, you will realize that beneath it, and under, you know, supporting it and sustaining it is the ego, the sense of self-importance. Um, so this is also explains why it's very important to become aware of our nothingness. However, um, it's not quite our nothingness. We have to become aware that everything that we think about ourselves is built on a faulty foundation that we are not the masters of the universe we think we are, that we are really broken, fractured, small, petty, 
insignificant beings. I would prefer rather than the use of the nothingness because to be aware of our no thingness is actually a, an awareness that's extremely high. Um, you know, it's the, the stepping into the Advaita non-dual state or the Sufi Thana state, with the, which is the extinction of the self, where we realize we are not a thing. We are no thing. I prefer the, at the lower level, uh, it's to become aware of our own insignificance, how small and broken we are. So, you know, I want to work through these ideas. I, I mean, I've, I'm putting it all sort of here um, at once, but I want to take these and separate them into each, you know, tiny, tiny steps and understandings and focus sort of on a certain aspect, a smaller aspect every week. And then the next week, you know, we begin by coming back and talking about our experiences with what we were doing that particular week. Um, how easy was it for you to be in your body? How easy was it for you to be aware of your breath? or whatever, um, various different work tasks, and to slowly build up uh, our, our understanding of it, and then to have it all recorded so that other people can tap into this and begin to understand and make sense out of this whole um, process. Um, so there, I've talked a lot. <laughs> um, I talk for a living. People pay me good money to talk, but uh, um, this is where I'm coming from. So this is my goal. Um, you know, to educate people, to make people realize how important it is to learn to transform a higher level of energy and how important it is to figure out where we're broken and fractured and why we are not transforming that energy on a regular basis. Um, Mr. Gurdjieff said, remember yourself always and everywhere. And why can't we remember ourselves always and everywhere. It's because we are not using that energy properly. He says that at night, we accumulate all the energy we need to enter into those states during the day, but it's through our negative manifestations. We just waste that energy, so we're not able to do it. Um, are there any questions, any comments, any... I mean, I've talked about this with some of you a bit more than others, but I just want to make sure that we're all on the same page and that I have this in the, you know, the, 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 our first meeting so people can begin to get an idea where I'm coming from and what my aim is, what my own personal aim in doing this is. I don't have any questions. It's okay. clear for me. <laughs> I also don't have any questions. Okay. No. Oh, no. Uh, it's a lot of food for, uh, well, I'll be careful to say thoughts. But, uh, <laughs> a lot of food for impressions. A lot of food for being. Yeah. Michael, any comments? Any? Um, just when you're speaking about Object, objective versus subjective negative emotions, I guess. I remember reading a quote from Jean de Saltzman when she, she was asked, I think she was close to 100 years old or something, where she gets her energy to travel and speak. And she said that for my negative emotions. Mm. So she was, even at that point in her work, she was still transforming negative emotions, you know, that, that says a lot. Well, I, I have a feeling that she wasn't expressing her negative emotions, but, you know, she probably would have been talking more about the fact that she's freed up that energy that gives yes. us energy. Um, so, I mean, Mr. Gertz just says the first way we begin to work on our negative emotions is just through the non-expression of them. So rather than yelling at people or getting upset, it's we, we've got to move back further and further and further and further and further Till we get behind our negative emotions but at the beginning we start by not expressing them um and there are i mean we will work through this as well uh we're all broken around a certain negative emotion and it's different for all of us um finding out where we are each individually broken and this i will be doing through 
you know, probably a bit more, you know, when I meet with you, all of you one-on-one, -on -one, trying to get a, a, a greater background understanding. Um, just before this meeting, I, I met with uh, Michael, and Michael, well, you know, he had quite a lot of self-awareness in terms of that. He's got quite a degree of understanding. Um, but then it's, he's been in the grid shift work for a while. He's thought about these things. He's reflected on that. And so I'm going to, we're all going to get to that state, you know, bring you all up to make you aware of all of these things. Um, so you're, you're more along the path. And there are two people who couldn't make it today. Ian, uh, uh, he's also, he, he started in Buddhism and he's a bit more along the path. And then uh, Francis, um, uh, Ian is in Seattle or Portland, Portland, Oregon. Francis is in England. Francis has been in the work for 30 years as well. Mm -hmm. um, he's going to be a tremendous resource to give us a different perspective. So we're going to have a mix of uh, really good, uh, you know, from good experience to no experience. And uh, hopefully something will coalesce, that we will do something and we will understand something and grow and help other people as well. Um, through our, you know, questions, through our observations through our understanding um so any anything else uh, anyone wants to add any questions um is there anything that we can do to start now uh, well i try to become as aware of your body as often as you can um to self-sense to be aware of your entire body as one organic whole um hmm. I should also say uh, I'm part of a secret uh, criminal organization. Uh, I don't know if I should be saying this on uh, uh, recordings, but I am. I'm part of a group that uh, does not respect copyright when it comes to the teachings. And if any one of us gets a book, we scan it and we share it with each other. And uh, I have access to PDF copies uh, everything that you see me post online comes from my electronic library. Some of them I have to uh, run through a, an optical character reader. I've got to put, turn them into a JPEG and then turn them into a PDF and read it and massage it and clean it. And some of them are pretty clean PDFs. Um, but this is a roundabout way of saying I have an extraordinary library. Uh, if there's any books that you want, I probably have them. Um, there are certain books that are incredibly important as far as I'm concerned in terms of understanding the teachings. Uh, number one is In Search of the Miraculous. Uh, but don't read In Search of the Miraculous in and of itself uh, because there are a few minor errors that can, you know, an error of one degree if you're crossing the ocean can make you end up hundreds of miles off course. Um, there are a few minor errors in that, such as, you know, negative emotions. It's mm. just most negative emotions. There's also errors in that in terms of explaining self-remembering and a few other things. Um, views from the real world uh, is a good companion. So I recommend people read In Search of the Miraculous and then Views from the Real World. Uh, views from the Real World is, uh, you know, Mr. Gurdjieff is listed as the author, but uh, Madame de Salzman compiled it after his death. She asked for notes that people took and made about lectures and things they heard and speak about. And then she compiled them into that book. And that book provides an ideal counterweight to some of the mistakes, slight mistakes that have crept in to In Search of the Miraculous. So those are the, as far as I'm concerned, are the two most important books, In Search of the Miraculous, uh, Views from the Real World. Um, then there are other books that are really good that I think are, you know, are important. Um, Fritz Peters, uh, Boyhood with Gurdjieff. A lot of people in the Gurdjieff Foundation hate Fritz Peters because he didn't think too much of them. He didn't think much of a lot of people working in groups, and so they talk about his alcoholism and various different things. But as Mr. Gurdjieff said to Fritz Peters is, you know, I'm under your skin. I'm in your blood in a way that I'm not with people who came as adults to the work because Fritz Peters first met Mr. Gurdjieff at the age of 11 when he was basically dumped at uh, Mr. Gurdjieff's Institute in France and he lived there for a few years. Um, so he learned it in a different way. Um, he wrote two books that have been compiled into a single book, but the most important one is Boyhood with Gurdjieff, but they're both together now in a single book. I forget the name of the single book. When I quote, when I you know post Fritz Peters, I always quote, 
Boyhood with Gurdjieff, even though I'm getting it from the other book. Another really good book is uh, C.S. Not, um, you know, A Pupil's Journey. Uh, there's a lot of information there. Um, and another good book is uh, the, the Hartmans, um, Thomas and Olga the Hartman. Thomas started writing the book and he died before it got completed. And then Olga the Hartman completed it. Um, there's not as much teaching in that book, but you begin to see what an extraordinary human being Mr. Gurdjieff was. Um, and then, of course, Tales, uh, Beelzebub's Tales to his grandson. Um, it's such a difficult book because it's meant to make you focus all of your attention. And if you haven't read that book, um, do not read any kind of commentaries on it. Do not try and get a glossary of terms. Um, he introduces like something like 450 neologisms, new words, and he introduces them in a very specific way. So he will introduce a word without explaining it, and then 200 pages later, add a little bit more, and 400 pages after that, add a little bit more. Um, we never get a second opportunity or a second chance to receive a first impression. So the first time you read Tales, it's best not to have read any commentaries on it or try to understand it. Just confront it. Um, the first time I read it, I hated it. It, was, I, it took me 20 times to get past the first 50 pages. I thought it's just terrible, terrible. He didn't know how to write. What's he? It's, um, there, there was a rumor that Uspensky started that Mr. Gurdjieff had syphilis and his brain was degenerating. This was in the 1920s. And I believe that back in the 80s and early 90s, especially when I tried to read tales, it's like, yeah, it's obvious this guy's lost it, but he hasn't. It's an incredible book. Um, if you want to get glossaries and whatever, after the first reading, the first time to confront it without any kind of, you know, understanding of what's going on. It's a real difficult book to read. It's hard to digest. It requires requires such focus, such effort, such concentration, but it is well worth it, um, particularly for serious students of the work. And Meetings with Remarkable Men is also important. Um, Mr. Gurdjieff, you know, he said, uh, you know, Beyonce of Tales was the, the first series. Meetings with Remarkable Men was the second. And um, he didn't actually write uh, Life is Only Real Then When I Am, but he told his family to compile it from some lectures he gave after he died. Uh, he was writing that book and he gave up writing it and he figured that, that that's enough. That, that's a fairly advanced book. So um, for Ben to have read that for the first, there's so much you won't understand that's in that book. Um, but they're, they're very important. These books are all important and I have copies of them. Um, if you want them, um, just you know, send me a message. Um, any other questions? Um, it's 12 o'clock now. Um, you know, for this week, just try to become aware of your body in whatever way you can. Um, you know, we could begin the, the, the next session. You know, can you become aware of your whole body as one organic whole? Can you become aware of your body from the bottom of your feet to the top of your head, the touch of clothing on your body, the air that touches your skin, your feet, your hands. Um, this is the most important basic beginning in the work. Uh, it gets more and more and more complex, but this is where it begins. And even before then, it begins with the ability to relax ourselves, to calm down. So just try as best you can in whatever way you can to bring your awareness as often as you can, excuse me, back to your body this week over and over and over again. Um, are there any questions, any comments, anything anyone would like to add? Um, can you have me? Yes, we can. Yes, Martin. Yeah. Um, just um, maybe you want to, to share some uh, something uh, from my own experience. Um, well, 
Well, first of all, I'd just like to comment on, on uh, yeah, what you presented and the uh, good, good ideas. Um, it's, um, yeah, ever since I was maybe yeah, 15 or so, uh, I've um, kind of been, been um, very fascinated and drawn into and felt this uh, weird, uh, strange pull towards um, everything. I mean, like it started with Buddhism, um, but I'm not getting caught up in the exoteric uh, things, but um, more more central aspects, Buddhism, Hinduism. Etc. And then um, that, and and also been been very in my in my early years, been very interested in, in physics and the um, uh, leaps of imagination, and physics as a, as a jumping jumping board. Um, and it seems to me that what you presented of your gyps ideas just yeah it's it's made sense uh, on, on a very tangible scale um, to me um anyways that was just a uh, thought and um so yeah I've, uh, for, for a long time now it's been then um, ever since this self-observation uh, to call it practice started by itself um, uh, naturally you know you, you watch these these uh, these people these beings like Yuja, the Buddha Krishna Mukti um, just to name a few and, and you kind of think well, I, I did and I have for a very long time just thought that this idea of whatever superconscious just using that word, it's like their passive state of being. It's like you have to work, and then one day you will achieve this state of being, and then you won't have to be conscious of it anymore. Uh, it's like uh, it's like this. It seems like the ego is somehow involved in this idea, because then one day you'll have to you you're off the hook. You know, it's like. Uh, it's like this this fantasy that's very comforting because one day when I reach there, it will just be automatic. Mm-hmm. The way my my life is mechanical now, it will be conscious then without having to work for it. Anyways, and then I heard this uh, story <clears throat> about uh, um, well, it was a, a Zen story, um, and um, this sage sitting beneath a tree in China and uh, a king which um, sometimes visited his people uh, during night time just to, to and in disguise just to see how things were going in the kingdom and every time he, he visited this man was wide awake uh, sitting under this tree always alert and so he came one day uh, during daytime with his guards and uh, he asked what, whatever uh, is the reason for you being this watchful? What, what, what have you to guard? What have you to lose? And um, this this beggar uh, looked at him and uh, said, "It is the other way around. What is what is it you are guarding? You have nothing to lose." And uh, he's referring to his being being completely empty. And whereas I, I have. Most precious thing to lose, which is, you say, you know, his awareness, uh, consciousness, and um, even for 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 people, humans, beings, um, highly you know, evolved, uh, there is this this constant um, work that has to be done. It's not that you reach this state and then you can relax. Um, and uh, 
yeah, I just, um, it just struck me when I heard it. Yeah. And, um, it's, it's kind of a reason not to ever let yourself off the hook. Yeah. Well, M Mr. Gurdjie said the most important quality we have is the power of our attention. And you can never get back a moment of inattention. Uh, it's gone. And uh, it's something that we should be preserving and conserving and realizing just how important attention is. Um, at any rate, it's, it's, it's a little over. I know that uh, it's after midnight in Australia. And Michael, you've got to get up at like four in the morning. So you'll have a... <laughs> very, very little sleep. Um, so, gentlemen, I'd like to thank you all for uh, participating today. And uh, try to be aware of your body. Bring yourself back to the sensation of self in whatever way we can. And we'll talk about this and begin uh, with this uh, next week. And we're going to be meeting here at the same time every Sunday. Uh, so, take care. Uh, I'm going to leave you now. Uh, thank you. Bye now. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. Have a nice week. You too.